Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're back here with John Heisman at his studio for part two of our chat. John, did you ever go into the booze drug thing? Never. No. Never. I, a, a glass of wine, and I really know I've had it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and um, that was always the case with me. I couldn't yeah. deal with it really. So. Yeah. So I never, I never enjoyed it. I tried, you... I tried smoking, you know, yeah. wonderful after a gig, you know, light a cigarette and stand there, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you wind down purely by socialising and, and... Yes, and, I uh, sit there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll have a beer, you know, yeah. but I mean, I won't have more than one or two because yeah. basically it's not, you know... It's, yeah. I mean, Coliseum um, weren't p p particularly outrageous in that respect. Anyway, no, though. they I were mean, really cool. I was su surprised someone once said to me that the worst wreckers of hotel rooms were was um, Lindisfarne. Well, that, <laughs> well, I must say that's a shock. Yeah, I mean, I always thought it was The Who or, or Zeppelin, yeah, but no. apparently it was uh, Lindisfarne. With the, um, anyway, I might be wrong, but someone once said that to me. They had that Well, I think your story in the book about Keith Moon making sure that the television was on when it went out the window <laughs> and going down, yes, his, his, staging everything very carefully, yeah. oh, that's a lovely... That's I mean, his, lovely, his, that's his lovely. pranks had to be perfect. That's a lovely, that's yeah. absolutely... I loved that. <laughs> I thought that was great. Have you ever had to play or carry on... Uh, really sick or injured oh yeah the big problem for me was food poisoning on the road yeah we were spending i don't know 240 nights on the road yeah uh, at certain times of uh, my career and one was eating all the time out yeah. and three or four times a year you would get food poisoning yeah. because and you're eating out all the time in yes restaurants, exa exactly and, and of course you're, you're eating out through the, the late 60s and the early 70s when there, when weren't, there, there weren't the food standards i mean yeah. you know the motorway service cafes in, in in germany i got caught several times you know yeah. Yeah. and the point is that i played really sick i can remember being take, pulled out of bed dressed mm. taken to the gig in paris at the olympia in paris put on the drum kit did yeah. the gig Lifted off off the drum kit, yeah. carry undressed and put back into bed by the crew. But you could do the drumming because. Oh yes, yes, yes. And time and time again, the interesting thing was that I'd I'd go on, I'd have a brandy and port before I went on. Yeah. And I was right as rain at the end of the gig, and I could hardly walk before I went on. And that's another very odd thing about this this the whole way this works. You know, the body's we don't know a lot about how all this works, but it, yeah. it's clever. How about injury? What about things like no. um, because we? No, I cut the top of my thumb once. Ah before a gig at the Country Club in Hampstead yeah. with Coliseum and had to cancel the gig and that's the only gig I ever had to cancel in my life. What would you say is your, if you have one, your favourite moment as a drummer? I think, okay, we, uh, um, Coliseum had been formed yeah. and we went into the studio and we made an album. We finished the album, we got on with our lives and we weren't going into a studio like they do today and stopping for three weeks, right? We'd go in in the morning yeah. And at four o'clock, we pack all the gear up and go off to the gig. Yeah. There was none of this business. So you'd be recording from 10 o'clock in the morning until three or four, and then off to the gig, right. So we'd finish the album, end of story, you see. And then it was a first foreign tour, the Danish tour. Yeah. So we got on the boat, we drove up through Germany, you know, in those days, all two vans, a gear van, and us in the you know, people wagon with aircraft seats yeah. and all that nonsense, no seat belts, you know, and mad as hatters, you know. Yeah. Up we go to, to Denmark, we go all the way around Denmark, and then we come all the way back down again and we get on the boat at somewhere and we finish up at Dover again. And we get off at Dover and we've got a gig in the book that night, which is the Lees Cliff Hall in Folkestone. <laughs> so we drive along the coast from Dover to the Lees Cliff Hall in Folkestone and you can't get near the place. You cannot get near the place. It's absolutely, the road's blocked, there's police there and the whole nine years. And the boys say to me, oh no. They put us on with somebody. Let's fuck off. Let's go. Let's go yeah. home. You know. Tell yeah. the office. Tell the office we missed the boat. You know what I mean? Yeah. I said no, no, no. We've got to keep faith with the office. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. Of course, when we got in there, the album had been released. It had charted, and nobody had told us. No one told you. Uh, They'd come to see us. <laughs> That's a pretty nice moment, isn't and it? That was a good moment. Yeah. But in those days, you know, just phoning. If you picked up the phone in Germany at, 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 after a gig, you know, and said yeah. uh, to, the, to the guy in the, on the reception, right, can you, I need you to dial me a number in England. I mean, I remember trying that, and the concierge said, excuse me, he said, England is sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> it was at one o'clock in the morning, you know. Of course, England there were no is, mobiles. Really no, no, that. England is sleeping, yeah. you know. I thought to myself. <laughs> <laughs> What does he know about my wife's habits? Yeah. <laughs> what about this thing about drummers having a certain fraternity? When they gather, there seems to be a sort of a sort of celebration. Yes, kind of but, but you've got to remember that you don't see many drummers. Yeah. You only see them at festivals. 
you know, yeah. if, you, if you're playing with a big band, for instance, you know, you've, got four, you've got four or five trumpet players, you've got yeah. five sax. And you're and the only drummer. You're the only drummer. So you can spend years, and then it, it, it's on the festivals so it's a you meet the other guys. So bump yes. into each other. Yes, yes. So it's for that reason, not yes. so much the yes. instrument itself. And particularly the guys you really like, you know, you stand yeah. on the side of the stage and watch absolutely fantastic players, yeah. and they come off and you say, oh, God, you know, brilliant, you know, and they say, what do you mean? You were wonderful too. And, and that's how it kind of, it works. There, there and, does seem to be a lot of that going on. People com compliment each other yeah, a lot. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, because we're all so different, I think. Yeah. I mean, if the truth is told, I can sit and listen to a drummer at a festival and I don't really understand why he's doing what he's doing where he's doing it, because yeah. it's not what I would do. Yeah. But I can also appreciate how well it works in the music and how good it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, and, and the thing is that anybody that does something that I can't, I'm always in awe of anyway. Yeah. But what do you think about these guys like Joe Jordison and people like that who do this amazing sort of speed with the double pedals and that, and then they go up onto the roof and they go upside down and do their solos and they're, they're incredibly I, fast I've and heard very, some very... fantastic heavy metal drummers yeah. Yeah. playing unbelievable stuff, yeah. with, you know, fast, clean, tight, wonderful coordination between yeah. the feet and the hands, all out, you yeah. know, brilliant, absolutely. Yeah. It's, the guy, it's the guys who do the one-handed rolls and all that business and yeah. never play with anybody yeah. that I object to. Because <laughs> I could never do a one-handed roll. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's also about fear, isn't it? I mean, that, yes. that's the thing. Yes, I mean, exactly. uh, yeah, um, sure, sure. you're very much, uh, you're passionate about the fact that the, the importance of playing for the band, playing for, for exactly. what's I don't play on. the drums, I play the band. Yes. And that's why the phone never stopped ringing. Well, that that's leads what, that's us actually what, well, quite yeah. onto this, which is John's book, Playing the Band, um, which was published a couple of years ago. Yes. And um, he's kindly given it to me to, to, to read. In the it? toilet. Yeah, in the toilet. In the toilet. <laughs> but you read mine. <laughs> May I read yours? What about Ringo? Oh, Ringo was fantastic. I, yeah. I have no idea what he played. I don't know what he played on. Well, I love his drumming. Yes, no, me I too. Always loved it. Me too. And, and, but what was more interesting was it wasn't about the drum kit and it wasn't about getting a good sound out of a drum kit and recording it the way a drum kit sounds. It yeah. was about altering the sounds of the drum kit to work in the track. Now, yeah. I have no idea whether that was him or whether, you know, Paul would turn up with a couple of wet tea towels and lay them over the kit and say, that's the sound well, I want. That's and the... he'd sort of say, oh my God. You know, I have no but idea how it worked. on, on Let It Be, the last verse, it does sound like there's towels been put over this. Well, they did that a lot, apparently. Yeah, they did all that, they did all that kind of thing. How do you think um, drummers are perceived these days? I, I don't think they are perceived. Not by anybody who's not another drummer. Yeah. I don't think the general public has any concept of drummers anymore. But strangely enough, I, I set up my kit when this Mare Band Dangerous book came out in uh, Waterstones in Watford. Had, they used right. to have quite a big Waterstones there. Right. And we set the kit up. And, and now um, it's closed because you went in and played the drums, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Actually, uh, spectators complained up the, up, oh, up, love up, it. The, up the road. Because, oh, I love uh, it. Not because they didn't like it, because people were sitting there having their eyes checked and they, all of a sudden they go like that because I'm <laughs> banging them. But um, right. basically these uh, uh, 14, 15 year old uh, people came in, boys and girls, and I had some books there. And the idea was that um, uh, if they bought the book and I signed it, they'd get a go on the drums. It was okay. a bit of fun. Um, a lot of them just didn't buy the book and had a go anyway. But anyway, a lot of them were crowded ra crowding around. And I, I was saying, you know, I wanted to do another book eventually. And I'd like to get people like, um, say, Jerry Jordison. And, and the girls just said, if you get Joey, I'll buy, I'll buy the book. Not because they're interested in drums, because they, the, he's a kind of hero. That's interesting. But yeah. for that generation, it seems to have become a kind of iconic thing to do, to play the drums. Well, that's interesting, because I think there was certainly a missing kind of one or two generations when you never saw a drummer on television and when there was a fleeting shot of somebody with an arm raised, yeah. you never ever actually saw never it saw the drum. It, hit, it, was, hit it drum. was off before yeah. you... Sorry. So uh, maybe it's changing. I mean, the, the, but it's all, it's all secular. People, or what the youth want to do is to find something new. When we were kids, you know, I, I uh, became a drummer and Barbara's parents were horrified, you know, her girl was going out. Yeah, a girl was going out with a bloody drummer. Didn't have a know. proper job. No, I mean, this is ridiculous. Well, I love the idea of when you eventually played the Albert Hall with, um, for the first time, the Coliseum. Your mum came to the gig and said, that was great, but when are you going to get a proper job? Well, exactly. So this, you can't rely upon this, Reverend, you know. You know you're going to have to, you know. Do you think it's something that, I mean, Kenny Jones said this, that um, he said it's a life sentence. He said you've got to do it. He said, oh, yes. Once you start playing, yes, yes, you absolutely. can't stop. You I've, can't just, I've just ordered a new drum kit. Yeah. I mean, mad as a hatter. You know, I've got, I've got more drums and I've had hot yeah. dinners and I've just ordered a new, big new Gretsch drum kit. Gretsch, lovely. Because I started off on Gretsch. You yeah. know. Well, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. I had 68 Gretsch drum, drums here, yeah. all right? And I, I just built the studio and I, uh, we couldn't store them. I didn't know what I was going to do, you yeah. know? And uh, I just bought this as the studio drum kit, yeah. which is a ninety, which is a nineteen eighty two, nice a pearl yeah. maple drum kit, the way they used to make them. Um, and uh, I thought, well, I better sell some drums, you know. So I put a drum kit together and put it in the exchange in Mark. 
And the guy rang up and he said, oh, he said, I see. He said, we can't get Gretsch drums in Ireland. He said, I see you've got a Gretsch drum kit for sale. He said, uh, I'd be very interested in that. I said, oh, I've got, I've got several. I said, I've got a huge, you know, I was going to feed them. He said, how many have you got? I said, I've got 68 Gretsch drums here. He said, OK, he said, I'll come with a truck and I'll buy the lot off you. And I said, well, shouldn't we agree a price before you come? And he said, no, 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 no. He said, when you get there, you'll take my price. Don't worry. And this rickety old van pulls up outside, yeah. you know, with two guys. They get out, there's all these bloody drums in here. He took the whole lot and paid me a big wadge of money in cash. And when he went down the road, the van went down the road like this. <laughs> <laughs> I think to myself now, what were you doing? What were you doing? But I couldn't store kids, it. I couldn't store it any. Yeah. Paiste came and took 140 cymbals out of here. Yeah. I rang him up and said, you've got to come and help me out here, fellas. I said, I can't yeah, deal with this. Every time you make a new cymbal, you send me a new bloody cymbal. I said, <laughs> you know, so they turn up with a truck, you know. Yeah. I mean. What are you up to at the moment, John? What's the... Uh, oh, the I'm working on a new album for Barbara Thompson, probably her last album. Yeah. Uh, we've started work on a new Coliseum album. Yeah. Uh, but all this is dependent on Barbara getting the next fix because basically her Parkinson is now 16 years in right. and uh, each drug you take lasts about three years before it effectively wears off right. and we're now waiting for a big um, a new medication from Sweden which the National Health Service don't want to pay for. Right. So we're okay. fighting the National Health Service. Right. Well, to get it. But once we get it, in theory, we can get back on the road. Yeah. Well, I wish you well for that. Thank you so much. Um, Mad, Bad and Dangerous. I enjoyed it you, very much. You've read it? I have, yes. Um, I enjoyed uh, it enormously. You dipped in and out, you were saying. <laughs> well, it's, I, it wasn't something I would read from left to right, but actually yeah. I did in the end read, read it all. And I, I yeah. just flicked through and find a nice bit, you know, and yeah. enjoy that, you know, uh, before I went to bed at night or sitting on the loo. And, and the thing <laughs> is that uh, it, was a great, it was great fun. Yeah. And of course I know, a lot, I know a lot of the guys, or and I certainly know of all of them, so yeah. at the end of the day yeah. it, was like, it was like a... a, a, a a set of, of, of conversations with old friends, really. It was very nice. I enjoyed it enormously. Good oh, idea. Oh, well, good I'm idea. glad. Um, if we do another one, would you like to be involved? Oh, yes, I'm sure, could, bad I'm, sure, I'm sure I could tell you a story or two. John, thanks so much for talking to us Great and inviting pleasure. us here to this lovely studio of yours. And uh, good luck with uh, all that stuff with regard to Barbara and, um, and Coliseum's new album and all that sort thanks of Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Oh, hi. Hope you enjoyed that interview with John Heisman. What a legend, eh? Uh, if you haven't seen the first part, it's over there with all our other videos. Please always remember to uh, like, subscribe, and share with all your friends. Next up, we've got Dave Mattox, another legend, amongst a load of others in our next batch of videos. Hope you enjoy them. You guys like that, George? Feels good. Ooh.